matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. Nuh-uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2. 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 My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. Well, happy Father's Day. Uh, welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online. We hope all of you dads have a great day today. We're sorry you couldn't be with us in person. We've had a great first couple of weeks back and we're really looking forward to things getting to the point where everyone can be back together each week. And we really hope that soon. And if you're not able to join us here, I really hope You'll spend time each Sunday in a special time of prayer from 9.30 to 10. Prayer is what's sustaining us through this difficult time, and it'll be what gets us all the way through. Now, let me remind you of a couple things going on at Cherry Avenue right now. We're taking nominations for elders and deacons for 2021 at the moment. Nomination forms are at each entrance and the Welcome Center in the lobby, or you can call the office and we'll get one to you. Those nominations will be taken through July 1st. And we've started our on-site Celebrate Recovery meetings again every Tuesday at 7 o'clock, and that meets upstairs in the auditorium. We're not doing dinner right now, but we are doing everything else. Don't forget that our online Bible study is posted every Tuesday. It's a great opportunity to study God's Word, even at home. And so we hope you'll join us for that. And every Wednesday, of course, we bring you a short midweek update and encouraging devotional thought. Sometimes you get to the middle of the week and you just need a boost. And so those are posted every Wednesday morning. All of our videos are available on our website uh, under the media tab. And they're on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and our Vimeo channel. So please check those out if you haven't. As we come to our prayer time this morning, we have a praise. Uh, John L's grandson, Andrew, came home from the hospital. And we want to thank God for that. We want to continue to remember Matthew O. He's a 12-year-old uh, who's in the hospital with an infection on the brain that they're having trouble clearing up, and so we want to remember him and his family. We want to pray for Linda B's friend, Paulette, as she fights cancer right now, and her friend Ed, who has been in the hospital also. And Carol G, who is Patsy M's sister-in-law, had a stroke, and so we want to lift her up to the Lord. And we want to continue to remember uh, little Molly Alice I and her family. She has had a roller coaster uh, of the past couple of weeks. And she several surgeries, and she and her family really need our prayers. And we need to continue to pray for our country. With all the turmoil and the hardship and the division, we need to be refocused on the Lord now more than ever. So let's pray together this morning. Lord, we're grateful for all you do for us. You blessed us in so many ways, more ways than we could count, and we don't thank you enough for that. But we are grateful. And Lord, we thank you for the answered prayers we've seen. We're grateful for those we've seen come home from the hospital. 
and how you blessed in that. And we just continue to lift up those we've mentioned this morning, especially little Matthew and, and Molly Alice, who are fighting so much at such young ages. We pray for strength for them, for wisdom and skill for their caregivers, and we pray for strength for the rest of their families. And Lord, we lift up our country right now. There's so much division and strife and so much fear right now. We need healing and unity so badly, and we ask that you would bless us in that and that you would help us to be part of that healing, that we might turn back to you as a nation. Father, we pray your blessings on us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, for the last month, we've been in a series called What Would Jesus Undo? Where we're looking at things in our life and our world that grieve the heart of Jesus and how we can begin to get rid of them. And we've looked at indifference. We've looked at hollow worship. And after the choir prepares our hearts, Scott will look at hypocrisy. Welcome to the middle of June and summertime in Virginia. You know about this time of year you're going to hear someone say it's too hot for coffee. Well I want to let you know those people do not understand coffee drinking and they are not to be trusted. Right. Now maybe you've seen the bracelets on people over the year that say WWJD. You know anybody ever worn one? Still have it? Yeah. WWJD. What does that stand for? It stands for, what would Jesus do? Now, I understand that sentiment, and I agree with it. We need more people willing to do what Jesus would do. But what we're doing now is we're trying to answer the question, not what would Jesus do, but what would Jesus undo? What are, what are the things that really grieve the heart of Jesus? <clears throat> what is it when Jesus sees this in our lives? He says, I would undo this so you could have something better. Week number one, we talked about spiritual apathy. Jesus would undo a lukewarm spirit. Last week, we talked about hollow worship. Jesus wants all of our hearts. Not, worship isn't just the songs that we sing, but worship is the life that we live. To introduce today's theme, I want to tell you a story about something Jesus would undo. Now, this happened to me one day. It was a long time ago. <clears throat> Probably has happened several times, but I remember this one incident when I was actually driving to the office. And this was in another city. It's a long time ago. I'm driving on this four-lane street, you know, two lanes going one way, two lanes going the other way. But I'm in the right-hand lane, but I need to get over into the left-hand lane to make a left-hand turn. And so I checked my mirror, and I didn't see anything, and I started to move over when I heard it, Arr! you know, I quickly adjusted back into my lane, and being the man of God that I am, I acknowledged my mistake humbly, it's my, you know, my fault, my fault, my apologize, that's how you translate the international sign of apology when you're driving, my bad, you know, and I said, sorry, man, I, I didn't see you, I'm not going to... I'm not going to bring up the fact that you were probably going 55 and a 35, but I misjudged it, my bad. Unfortunately, 
he did not receive my sign of repentance. Instead, he chose to speed up and go around me and give me the international symbol for one way to God. You know what I'm talking about. Peel the banana, read between the lines, whatever you want to call it. I, I, I was disappointed in his response, but I chose to let it go, being the man of grace that I am. And then I saw the bumper sticker on the back of his car, Grace Baptist Temple, where we live for Christ or, or something like that. Immediately, my attitude did a 180. I didn't like that church because it was a big church. I mean, they ran six, seven hundred. We only ran about 250. And they always thought they were better than every other church in town. At least that's how I saw it. So I wanted to speed up and I wanted to give that jerk a piece of my mind. Fortunately, my turn was coming up, so I chose to let it go. Gracious man that I am. But I had to fight really hard not to call the preacher of that big church and let him know just what a poor job he did in teaching his members how to act on the highway. Now, I transformed very quickly, you see, from a repentant one into feeling that God had uniquely called me to execute judgment upon the minister of this church with ungodly members. But I will say that over the years, I have gotten calls like that about members of my church. And I'm not telling you if it was anyone here, but, you know, sometimes I feel like I, I, shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to bring this up. But if you do have a Cherry Avenue Christian Church bumper sticker, and it's got to be an old one, on your car, let the Spirit of God lead you to refrain from pointing directly to heaven at people when they make driving mistakes. What would Jesus undo? Something that Jesus would undo is a behavior or an attitude that he despised with all of his heart. Jesus would undo hypocrisy. Those who claim one thing, but then live in a completely other way. Jesus would undo hypocrisy. Now, I want to ease into this subject because hypocrisy is no fun to talk about. <clears throat> it's not easy to see in our own lives, but it's also very easy to see in other people's lives. In fact, how many of y'all would say, I know a hypocrite? Raise your, raise your hand, right? I know a hypocrite. How many of you would say, I'm sitting beside a hypocrite? Don't raise their hand, but don't raise your hand either, because that would point right back at you. It, it, but it's really, really easy to see hypocrisy in other people's lives, but it's not so easy to see hypocrisy in our own lives. In fact, in my opinion, this is a subject that is sometimes mistakenly belittled by preachers like me. For example, there's an old preacher joke that went around for years, probably still going around. One of the most common things that we'll hear from people who have objections to Christianity in the church, they'll say, I'm not going to church because they're all a bunch of what? Oh, they're all a bunch of hypocrites. They say, they say that all the time. I'm not going to church because they're all a bunch of hypocrites. And a lot of preachers, and I've said it, will often say, well, you might as well join them because we always have room for one more hypocrite. Now, we think that's kind of funny, and it is kind of, because there's a little bit of truth to it. But in my opinion, that really dismisses some very real pain that many people have when they're dis disappointed by the behavior or the actions of those who claim to follow Christ. Some of you would know this firsthand. There was someone that you looked up to spiritually. They said one thing. They did something else. It's very, very painful to you. They, they represented one thing. Could have been a youth minister. Could have even been your mom or dad. Your mom and dad were one thing in church, and they'd come home, and they'd act totally different at home. It can be incredibly, incredibly painful. I spent several weeks visiting a, a Christian lady in a psych ward years ago, and she was there because she had been sexually abused by the minister. She f did finally come out of it, but she was in really bad shape. Outside of her husband and children, I were the, was the only one allowed in, and I just went in to help with spiritual counseling. The only thing I could do to help was to quote Psalm 23 and sing Amazing Grace. I was really out of my league there, but I did it, and it seemed to calm her down. Some people, though, you see hypocrisy. Well, you claim this, and you did this, and it devastates them. They walk away from the church. Many people walk away from God because of hypocrisy is a horrible sin. Fortunately, this lady and her family did not. But what would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo hypocrisy. 
I like what the author and theologian Brendan Manning said about hypocrisy. He said this, he said, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. This is what the unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. What would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo hypocrisy. So let's go ahead <clears throat> this morning <clears throat> excuse me, and build a foundation in understanding what hypocrisy is. But to understand what it is, we also have to acknowledge what it's not. Because hypocrisy is not the disparity between what we do and what we wish we did. It's not the difference between how we behave and how we wish we behave, would behave. Like, I wished I didn't have bad thoughts, but I did. I wished I didn't say that, but I did. What that is, that's just sin. It's not hypocrisy. There's a difference between sinning and being hypocritical. Hypocrisy is the gap between what we show and who we are. It's the difference between what we say and how we live. It's the difference between our public persona out here and our private character in here. What would Jesus undo? He would un undo the show when the real life isn't consist consistent with what we show. In fact, whenever Jesus would rail against hypocrisy, there was a Greek word that he used. It's the word hypocrites. It even sounds like hypocrite, right? Hippocrates. What, and what this word literally means is it means an actor or a stage player. It means one who hides behind a mask. And that's exactly what some so-called Christians will do. I'm actually one person, but I'll show you a mask. In fact, here's one right here. I'm the angry hypocrite, you know. Those are the ones who say, hey, don't drink, don't smoke, don't you ever run with girls who do. But when the mask is off, this person has secret addictions going on in the background. And they're going to show one face, but their real person, their real behaviors are very, very different. There's also the happy hypocrite. This is the one that says, praise the Lord, brother. Oh, glory to God. You know, and they're putting on a show. They're acting hallelujah, glad to see you at church when they fought all the way to church with their spouse. But oh, praise the Lord. We're fine. Oh, we need to, listen, build each other up. Did you see what she wore to church? Who does she think she is? Oh, praise the Lord, brother. This is what Jesus hated. It was when from the outside they would show one thing, but from the inside there was something very, very, very different. In fact, Paul has one little verse that to me expresses or best represents what hypocrisy is. He says this in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. He says, they claim to know God. That is, they show it, but by their actions, that is, by the way they live, they deny him. And Jesus hated this. He talked very, very directly about what hypocrisy was. He said, anytime you're giving to be seen, hey, everybody stop what you're doing because I'm going to be generous right now and I want everybody to know how generous I am. Well, that's hypocrisy. <clears throat> Whenever you're praying to be heard, you know, the Pharisees would literally stand on the street corner. Oh, dear God, we pray glorify you, we pray for so and so, and they're putting on this outward spiritual pride to impress other people. And Jesus said that is completely hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy whenever you fast to be noticed. Oh, I'm so holy, I'm so spiritual, I'm denying myself physical food, I want to be noticed here. Everybody see this. It's hypocrisy whenever you criticize someone for doing something, Jesus would say, and you do the same thing. It's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy, Jesus would say, whenever people were taking advantage of the poor. He hated that. Jesus, ne listen, Jesus never spoke more harshly than he did when people would put on the mask. One time, Whenever he entered the temple and people were selling animals as a sacrifice, he didn't just come in and say, Now, boys, I told you not to do that. You guys need to be nice. You need to not be about your personal profit. No way, man. Jesus came in. He said, I'm not going to stand for this. He took the tables and overturned the tables. He said, This is my father's house. It will not become a den of thieves. This is a place where we seek my father in prayer. 
He never spoke more harshly than he did when people were hupocrates, when they put the mask on. Did you ever look at the seven woes in Matthew chapter 23? Jesus says again and again and again, Woe to you who live like this. Let me show you just some of them. I'm not going to read all of them, but just some of them. Verse 13, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying to. See, Jesus is saying, you guys are slamming the door of heaven right in people's faces and won't let them in. Verse 16, he says, Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. He says, you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? That is, you guys are totally inconsistent about what's important. He might say today, you make the church building sacred, but it's the church in the building that is sacred. Verse 23 and 24, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. That's an awful picture, isn't it? Sort of like you're making mountains out of molehills and molehills uh, in the mountains. He says this in verse 27. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. That is, you play actors. You are like whitewashed tombs who look beautiful on the outside, but on, in the inside you're full of all sorts of ungodly stuff. That is, you're full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, he says, on the outside you appear righteous to everyone else, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy, and wickedness. <clears throat> now watch what Jesus calls them in verse 33. He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers. Then he asks, how will you escape being condemned to hell? So what is a hypocrite? It's the one who wants to look good on the outside, but on the inside, we're very, very, very far from God. We want the illusion of public virtue but inwardly we're full of private vices. What's so interesting to me is this. Jesus didn't say, woe to you who say bad words. He didn't say, woe to you who watch bad shows on Netflix, sometimes. He didn't say, woe to you who do bad things. He said, woe to you who do it, but act like you don't. Woe to you who put on the show, not woe to you who are imperfect. Woe to you who are imperfect, but act like you're something different. And I would argue that today, perhaps more than ever, social media is the perfect breeding ground for hypocrisy. How many of you might agree with me, right? This is the place where you can all day long show what you want other people to see, when in reality you're so much different from that. And we see it all the time. Here's my perfect marriage. I love my husband so much. He's such a great man of God. I'm so thankful for him. Here we all are all lovey-dovey. And in reality, you're not even sleeping in the same bed. Happens all the time. Here I am doing my devotion. Here's my coffee cup, because it's not godly without a coffee cup, in your devotion Instagram picture, you know. Here's my coffee, and here's my Bible. I'm not going to tell you exactly how much time I spent getting the image just right. I spent more time that than I did doing my Bible study. But I'm going to show you what I want you to see. Or there's what I call the Lego life. I don't know if you remember the Lego movie. My grandson really likes those Lego movies. And you've probably not seen it unless you've got kids or grandkids. But there's a song and it goes, everything is awesome, everything is cool. I don't know if I got that exactly right. It's the only line I remember. I don't remember the rest. Everything is awesome, everything is cool. That's the only line you see that matters. Everything is awesome. That's what we do on social media. Everything is awesome. My life is awesome. I'm depressed. I'm miserable. I'm hurting. I'm doubting. Everything is awesome. What would Jesus undo? He would undo a spirit of hypocrisy when what we show is so different than who we are. Woe to you, Jesus says. How will you escape being condemned to hell? If you're a little, now listen, if you're a little bit uncomfortable right now, that's probably a good thing. Because that means you have some self-awareness. Because let me tell you right now, <clears throat> Some of you are going, oh, I'm so glad somebody's hearing this. I'm so sending the, them the link to this video. You know, they need to see it. The hypocrite 
It's so e easy to see in other people, but it's so difficult to see in yourself. Now, if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable because you're recognizing some inconsistencies, that's actually a good thing. That means, again, you're self-aware. That means you're open to what the Spirit of God will show you. And what I want you to see is there's hope for the hypocrite in all of us. There is hope. Let me show you the hope. Jesus shows it right there in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 and 26. He says this, he says, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. That is, you're showing the show, but you don't have the substance. Then what he says is this, Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, then the outside will be clean. That is, first let the Spirit of God do a work internally where no one else sees it. Because when internally you're being conformed to the image of Christ, when the Spirit of God working within you, when God's Word is transforming you, then out of an overflow of who you're becoming, you will display the goodness of God as a reflection of His work. Internally, not as an act to fool people on the outside. But you understand this? You can't clean the inside. Once, but once you allow God's Spirit to work on the inside, that's when the true spiritual work on the inside is done. Listen, all of us, we want to seem spiritual, but most of us don't want to put in the work. In fact, I think preachers are <clears throat> kind of taught this in seminary. At least I was when I went there. There was this idea that you never let people see who you are. The preacher always wears a suit and tie. Always. Never let them see you without a suit and tie. In fact, when I was in Lowland, North Carolina, the preacher at the Free Will Baptist Church mowed his grass in a suit and tie. Now, he was a great person, but bless his heart. You don't have to mow your grass in a suit and tie. I, I never had that problem, of course, but there are other ways that I've been a hypocrite. I've told people, I'm praying for you, brother, and never gave another, another thought. I'm going to be seeking God on your behalf. I'm in there with you, and I almost never, ever was. And everything that was wrong with me, I kept hidden behind this preacher mask. Jesus, listen, has, no, has zero tolerance for hypocrisy, but he has unlimited grace for a sinner in need of forgiveness. Jesus cannot stomach the show, but when anyone who's hurting drops a mask and says, forgive me, Heal me, redeem me, save me, change me. Jesus' answer is always yes. Because he did not come for those who appear to be righteous. He came for sinners. He didn't come for those who are healthy on the outside. He came for those who knew they were sick. He has no tolerance for the show. But he has unlimited grace for a sinner in need of grace and repentance. Now, <clears throat> there are some of you who need to drop the mask. But you might say, well, what if they find out? What if they know? What if they know that I'm not perfect? What if they know that I have faults? What if they know that I'm showing one thing and I'm not? Listen to me. You have nothing to fear when you have nothing to hide. You have absolutely nothing to fear when in the community of grace you ask for help. That's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sins doesn't prosper. Whoever lives like <clears throat> this behind the mask never finds the blessing of God. Whoever conceals their sins shows the false life on the outside, hiding the truth on the inside. Whoever conceals their sin doesn't prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The one who asks for help finds mercy. When you drop the mask, when you're honest, there's power. And you're only as strong as you are honest. Listen, we're not perfect people, living a perfect life, pleasing God in a perfect way. We're sinners. We're strugglers. We've messed up. We fall short. We have battles. We have struggles. We're afraid. And sometimes we're inconsistent. We want to do one thing, and then we do something else. We don't want to have those thoughts, and then we do. We don't want to go back to that old life, but we do. We find mercy in the presence of God because Jesus has zero tolerance for hypocrisy, but he has unlimited grace for a sinner in need of forgiveness. 
David prayed this prayer in Psalm 139. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to invite you to join me in praying it, praying this prayer. It's so easy to point out hypocrisy in other people, but it's so difficult to see in ourselves. And this is what David prayed. He prayed, say it with me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. What would Jesus undo? Listen to me, church. He would absolutely undo hypocrisy. And in our culture today, we are ripe with it. That's who we are. Let's pray. Father, today, <clears throat> please, I ask you to do a work in our church. Do a work within us. I ask you to do a work within me, God. I'm th and I want to thank you that on the other side, there's freedom and there's healing and there's grace and there's mercy. And we do need one another, God, and I pray for the conversations that are going to happen today, hopefully one person with another, where one person is going to talk to another one and I say, I'm addicted and I need help. I can't stop. I know this is going to shock you, but I've been doing this. I'm in trouble. I'm hurting. I'm afraid. I need someone there with me. God, and I pray that in those conversations we recognize that these are holy moments, that you are with us and you will bring healing for those who confess our needs. And I thank you, Father, for the grace of Jesus, and I pray that each one of us would be graceful as well. We understand he does not tolerate hypocrisy, but we thank you that he came for sinners, and we rejoice in that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I think one of the reasons God hates hypocrisy is because God is holy. He's faithful. He's true which means that he's the same at all times. And hypocrisy is where we show ourselves to be one way when we're really another. And God can't stand that because he can only be who he is. He is just, which means that sin has to be punished. But he's love, which means he was willing to take that punishment on himself so that we could be with him. That faithfulness to his justice and his love is what led Jesus to the cross. And that's what we celebrate in communion. Listen now as the worship band leads our hearts to the table, singing about that holiness of God.
such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. I will adore you. I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. In John 6, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. 1 Corinthians 11 says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Scripture goes on. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray. Father, it's amazing to think that you are fully just, but you are full of love. And that you've loved us enough that you sent your son to take the punishment that we deserved. He took that on himself. And Lord, we ask you to bless us as we remember that sacrifice this morning, that we might share that good news with the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Father's Day to all you dads. We hope you have a great, great day. God bless.